And a very warm welcome everyone to Working Options Masterclass Series. Um, we are a charity that provides various interactions with employers for young people to help them fulfil their potential um, and develop their life skills um, and to have that valuable interaction with employers. And today's session is uh, being led with us uh, today with colleagues from Erevina. And the session today is specifically on sharing top tips for you around CV and interviewing skills. Um, the session itself, as you are aware, will be recorded, so you will be able to find the recording via our website um, afterwards as well, if you'd like the top tips to, to go back on. And it will also be on the Working Options YouTube channel for access and other various social media platforms. So please make, um, you know, take the opportunity to ask those valuable questions of our colleagues. Um, they are the experts here today, um, and I'm sure, or hope, hopefully, we'll have all the answers to whichever uh, questions that you, you throw at them. There will be several um, opportunities to do this. You can use the chat facility um, uh, and the question and answer facility as well, and we'll make sure that those questions get to our colleagues. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Lucy and allow Lucy to introduce her colleagues from Erevina um, and then get the masterclass underway. Lucy, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Well, we're the team from Aravina. We're, we're part of the team. I'm just going to give a very brief um, introduction about what we're going to what we're going to cover, and then I'll let the team um, dive straight into it. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to Aravina. We're actually an executive search firm, um, so we see lots and lots of CVs. Um, so these these guys in, in the team, they're very, very well um, placed to give um, lots of practical advice. So William's going to talk about um, how to write your CV and your cover letter um, and how you can really get um, get get that CV noticed by people. Uh, recruiters tend to see a lot of CVs and they will not look, look at each CV for very long. So. William will cover some hints and tips about how you can actually make your CV stand out. Uh, Gemma's then going to talk about interviews and how you can really um, prepare yourself uh, for interviews. And Valerie is going to talk about uh, different types of assessments because not all interviews are now face-to-face. -face. Some of them are on Zoom um, and some of them are via assessment centre. So um, we're going to cover that. And then Emily's going to run a really useful um, session at the end on about overcoming problems because let's face it we all we all have setbacks um and we need to just pick ourselves up and learn learn from those and emily's going to give some really good advice on that and at the end we'll have lots of time if people want to ask uh, questions and answers so who who are aravina we're an executive search firm so that means you might have heard the term headhunters which is a quite quite a bizarre bizarre term but we actually look for leaders of very fast growing tech companies so some of the companies that we work with you may um you may use or you may come across so people like be real um we've hired a number of executives um for the be real team uh, too good to go we've hired um a couple of executives to help them grow their business and zoom which we're using today uh, we very recently hired their head of Europe. So we work with companies to hire very senior people to help them grow their, their businesses. And these companies pay us to deliver that service. So we see a lot of CVs, um, and I mean a lot of CVs. So it's really um, great that the team can help share the tips on how we can make these CVs stand out. Um, and CV presentation and interviewing, it really is important. So I um, hope you enjoy the session and I hope you learn lots from it. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, William. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is William and I work at Aravina, as Lucy has mentioned. I don't, I'm relatively early in my career so that I don't feel like I'm too detached from the stages that you were all at. I imagine there's a, a, a range of ages, so I... Nonetheless, don't feel like I'm distant from any particular um, age. So, Lucy, onto the next slide, please. Okay, so I think to start with, I think CVs are you, you, your foundation, right? You will probably need to apply with the CV as the first step of any process, maybe in person, if you have to print it out and hand it, if it's for a certain job. 
and no sort of retail job, but for your, I suppose, longer term career, CVs are common in most places. So I think it's really tough to start, what is a CV? Where do I, how do I write it? What should it look like? And I think the advice I would give there is just very straight and simple and structured. So your CV is, of, of course, a summary of you, your education, your experience, and a bit about you, achievements and interests. And here's my real CV, as you can see. I did send that off, I believe, a few years ago now, three, four years ago. And as you can see, a very clear summary of what I've done, my grades, my schools, my university, my real work experience, some other experiences, and a bit on hobbies, achievements, interests. Clear bullet points, no spelling mistakes, clear formatting, and the correct use of things like bold and titles. That is, I would say, the number one thing to focus on with your CV. Of course, the bullet points are important. It's great to be specific. But if you have any formatting mistakes, spelling mistakes, they will jump out before the content is noticed. So that's what I would say. It doesn't need to be too long, as you can see, this is one page. But if Lucy, you go on to the next slide. As you can see, CVs can be different. So this is also one CV. My other one, the other one that you just saw was for banking. This is for law. And this is an example of the different industries and what they can require. So at the time I was applying to law, you needed a longer CV. So as you can see there, my university education and qualification section is a bit longer. So it has some more information on grades, percentage, percentages, module grades. And then as you can see in my experience, I, it's a lot longer as well. So there is no one size fits all. Uh, at the time I was applying law, well, uh, the law firms were looking for two page CV max. You probably won't ever need a three or four page CV, so you don't need to like, write your life story. Uh, I wouldn't advise that either because um, all the great information is then hidden by other points. And you can see I did a bit more information in terms of hobbies. And when, if you have the space, you can use it. Of course, sending a half page CV might look a little odd, but if you keep it around one page or two page for the relevant industry, you can also do that. I'll jump into a question as they come along, but feel free to send in questions as you are, as, as you think of them. So how do, we, how do you know what's expected from you in terms of the industry, in terms of the company? Well, of course, it can all vary. So a really good, valid point there. And what I'd say is speak to people. Use everything that's around you. And of course, we live in a digital age. So on this side, you can see where do you look for all of this kind of information, the jobs themselves, what they need from you. There's plenty of good websites that give you this kind, kind of insight. So of course, just Google banking CV or um, CV for law. And you have websites like Legal Cheek, and you have so many other websites that you can see on the slides. And they can let you know what we expect. Uh, some websites even just list it outright, two pages, one page. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, they, they don't tell you exactly what to, um, what to expect. So then I would go safely, stick to the one page CV. And what I like to think there is Elon Musk can write a CV in one page, the person who founded Tesla, the person who founded um, many brilliant companies, one of the richest people in the world. If he can get his CV to one page, so can you. And that's what I'd stick with if you don't know. And no one will penalize you if it's one, one page. Um, but of course, if you know if it needs to be two, go for two. And of course, in terms of just where to look, where to think, any information, Google is your best friend. Look for companies, look for industries. What is the big four accounting firms that say? What is FMCG? And all that information should come to you. And of course, if you're, you'll be applying with other people, I'm sure you'll know someone, speak to them. How long was your CV for that company actually? What should I do? Um, and of course, if you go to university or if you're in A-levels, there'll be career services. Speak to those individuals. How should you structure your CV? How should you 
go for this industry. They'll have insights as well. They'll partner with companies. Organizations that work in options can give you that insight. So speak to people, speak to anything and everyone you can. That's what I would say. And utilize all your resources, like your recruiters, like us, certain companies like Dartmouth Partners, speak about, uh, speak to certain pools of candidates like yourselves or you in a few years. And yeah, that's why I would say use all your resources. And of course, super importantly, get ahead of your deadlines. All of this Googling, all these CVs, all of these cover letters can get really, um, and get really overwhelming. Make sure you don't miss any dates just because you're uh, working so hard on the research on the application. On to the next slide, Lucy, please. And quickly on cover letters, I, I would have covered a lot of these points with the CV. It's once again a symbol. Keep it structured, keep it clear, no mistakes. And there's certain formats to follow. But generally, first paragraph, who are you? Where are you up to? Why are you applying to the industry? Second paragraph slash third or middle section. Why that company? Why that scheme specifically? And then in your final one, your skills and suitability. Where did you pick up the relevant skills? You can keep this to one page as well. And it's a letter, so keep your formalities like your addresses, yours sincerely, yours faithfully. And yeah, I know that was quite quick, but I do want to. I don't want to take too long. Of course, you can always pause on the recording, look at the section, a bit more sense, and give you that context for later. And I know we got, but we'll save questions to the end, and we'll move on to the next section. Perfect. Um, so I am Gemma. I joined Arabina in September last year as a grad and I've been here for around nine months now. Um, and before that, I was studying at the University of Liverpool. Um, so I, I really do understand the place you guys are in. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I was doing this interview process. Um, and, you know, before I joined Arabina, I had been working at Tesco Click and Collect. Um, and so I, I was kind of in a position where I thought, I don't have this executive recruitment experience, you know, and actually, um, you know, I, I clearly had the, the skills to, to kind of get the job and, you know, teamwork skills from Tesco and that kind of thing. Um, and so I can promise you all that you do have the experience and the knowledge to, to get these jobs. And I'll kind of talk you through tips and tricks on, you know, how to get that across in your interviews. Um, so first of all, Research is so key. Don't underestimate that. If you come into an interview and you know everything about a company and you know all different things about kind of what they stand for, what the job is, etc., and um, it will put you in a much better position and you'll stand out against other people because it's shown that you're really trying. And um, so you want to know the industry, the company, the role responsibilities, and the job spec a hundred percent. I'd always say kind of it's better to be better to be better to be early than late. So um I'd say arrive kind of 30 minutes early to the area and before an in-person interview and you know go and grab a coffee and kind of have a chill and then get to the office five, 10 minutes early. Um, you know, with tube strikes, train strikes, everything at the moment, you need to be kind of safer than sorry. Um, but you know, don't get there, you know, hours early. You don't want to be too eager, you just want to be punctual. Turn off your phones. If you're anything like me, when, especially when I was a student, you just want to check your phone all the time if it's on. So don't give yourself the opportunity to do that. Just switch it off and you can't have that possibility for instruction. Um, what to wear always feels like a big question. Um, and the best kind of advice that I was given is dress like the company. So are they smart, smart or smart casual? And you kind of want to mirror that. Um, what I would say is it's better to err on the side of smart um, than casual. So, you know, never wear joggers, crop tops, and I probably wouldn't wear jeans either. If you channel this dude on the right, you'll be, you'll be grand. Um, know your CV and cover letter back to front. This is kind of probably what's got you this far. This is what they thought, oh, this person looks really interesting. I definitely want to kind of interview them. And so you need to be that living and breathing version. So you want to know this um, completely. Listen to the interviewer. When you're stressed, you can kind of get a bit in your head and not actually really listen to what they're saying. And that will help you answer the questions in a more focused way. And um, so that's super important. And uh, make sure to ask kind of thoughtful, well-prepared questions that you think about before you do your interview. 
And I think most of all, be positive and, you know, don't be too critical of yourself. They don't expect you to be a five-time CEO and you have a lot of skills to, to bring to the table and you've got this far. So they obviously want to speak to you about it. And, and it's a two-way thing. They'll be trying to impress you and you'll want to impress them. So don't try and put too much pressure on yourself. It's a conversation and, you know, you're worthy of having that conversation and there's no reason why, why you shouldn't kind of get the job. Um, and, yeah, don't waffle. Um, it's always a big thing that, that we find. And even at an executive level, which, you know, the people we speak to, if people are just like waffling on um, for ages, it, it doesn't feel professional. So try and be um, concise. And next slide, please, Lucy. What I'm going to do is chat you through a few comment interview questions because um, it can definitely feel a bit overwhelming when you just don't know what you're supposed to say for a lot of these questions. Um, and what I did and would recommend you do is maybe take a note of some of these questions and go through them with your friends. If you can answer these questions when you're kind of sat with your friends, it will feel so cringy but it will be so much better than when you're doing with an interviewer. If you can do it to your friends and your family, you will definitely be able to do it in an interview. Um, and so kind of put yourself out of your comfort zone. So tell me about yourself. Um, always feels like it should be easier than it actually feels. Um, so don't overthink it. You just want to kind of tell them who you are, what you're studying or doing for work and um, what you're looking to do next. The next few questions you see here um, are really to do with the company and they rely on your research from the job spec, their website, et cetera. So, um, you know, what can you tell us about the company? Why do you want to work for us? And, um, you know, obviously they know about the company and the role, but they want to see, have you taken the time to, to do the research? So, for example, if I was answering, you know, one of these questions, um, why do you want to work for us? You know, I might I might talk about, you know, Ferrer Vina, on their website, I saw that diversity and inclusion is super important and that they're really pushing to have more female partners. And that's super important to me, aligns with my values. And that would show an interviewer that, you know, I've looked more than just kind of at face value at the company and that I've really kind of thought about the extras that the company does. And, and that's the kind of thing that will set you apart from other candidates. Um, in terms of quality, strengths, important things in a role, um, you should be honest, but also tailor them to kind of what information you've been given by the company. So you might have been kind of given role responsibilities and what they're looking for on a job spec or on the website. Um, and also some of this, you know, might also be kind of common sense. So if you are going for a data analyst job, you will want to focus more on your problem solving skills, your time management more than your customer service skills. And um, so I think it's really important to kind of tailor, tailor your answers towards that and to what they're kind of looking for. Weaknesses, what are your biggest weaknesses? I felt when I first answered this, that it felt like a trick question. And um, you don't want to say that you're a perfectionist and everyone says that, but it, it, that is not what they want to hear. They want you to be honest and reflect about, you know, you, you will have weaknesses, we all do, but you want to talk about something that you're, you know, actively trying to combat, overcome. And um, so, for example, you know, one that you could say would be, um, I've always struggled with present presentation skills, public speaking um, and at uni, I was really pushed outside my comfort zone because I had to give loads of presentations. And at the start, I didn't really like it, to be honest. But, you know, I had to do it so many times that actually it pushed me out of my comfort zone and I slowly became more confident. And, and it's now becoming something that, you know, I'm actually in the rhythm of doing and I'm much stronger at. And if you can show them that you've had the self-awareness to kind of actively try and improve something that you saw as a weakness, then that actually maybe is a strength. Um, and the last one I'll kind of talk to is this, what do you enjoy doing in your spare time? Um, again, not a trick question. They just want to know that you do stuff outside of work and that you have a life outside of work um, because that is healthy. And, you know, if you are in a sports club, it'll show that, you know, you enjoy kind of working in a team. And if you do art, it'll show you're creative. So it does also speak to other skills that you may want for these jobs, but also it just shows you've got a life, um, which is always important. And they do want that for you. Um, the next slide, Lucy, would be fab. And um, competency-based questions are, are a slightly different type of question. And um, so you really want to be using examples here um, more so than, than with others. Um, 
So that might be worded as, tell me about a time when you've shown, give me an example of when you've done that kind of thing. And it could be, you know, as I put here, drive resilient communication skills. They might also word that um, slightly differently. Uh, so you might have to kind of figure out in your head exactly what competency they're looking for you to, to address. Um, and I'll talk through kind of how you should answer this type of question. So the STAR framework on the right is your friend. So you want to talk about the situation you were involved in, the task you set out to achieve, and what you actually did, and, and what the result was. And you can also reflect on that. So what I'll do for an example is I'll answer the kind of the top question here and uh, just so you can see how I would go about kind of addressing that question. So tell me about a time when you've had several tasks to manage at one time or with conflicting deadlines. So this is kind of asking about time management and problem solving. So I could say when I was at uni, I was getting to my final few weeks and I had four essays due, you know, within a two week period um, and I really wanted to get a high mark. That was kind of my task. I wanted to get a high grade and, and really do my best on all of them. And that, you know, felt hard with such a time pressure. So what I did was I ended up setting myself deadlines um, and I set them. So the four weeks before each different essay had a deadline and it meant that I had, you know, a solid week to just focus my time on each essay and hand them in to my own deadlines. And the result of that was, I had the time to, to kind of focus on each essay individually and I ended up getting the good marks. And so, you know, this is something that I would use in the future to kind of manage my time more effectively. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a possible way of how you would use the STAR framework. Um, so, yeah, obviously happy to answer any questions at the end to do with interviews, but also Valerie will now go and cover kind of different types of interviews. Great. So, hi everyone. I'm Valerie. Um, I'm an associate here at Aravina. Joined about seven months ago now after completing an internship um, here. And prior to that, I, I had just graduated last year. So, I'm also not too far away from you guys in terms of you know stage of life. Um, and I'm hoping you can really take something away from from this presentation today. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. Thanks. So. Virtual interviews, as I'm sure um, some of you may already know, they are basically just interviews that take place remotely and they are becoming a lot more common, especially since the pandemic. So they're conducted pretty much in the same way as face-to-face -face interviews, but that said, they do require some unique considerations, which I'll just take you through. Um, so first, in terms of preparation, I mean, Gemma kind of, you know, mentioned this already and we can't emphasize this enough it's really essential to your success at these interviews you want to prepare and research the role the company and if possible the interviewers themselves as well um, you can check out websites the vid videos on youtube and also look into any news coverage on the organization this will help you give a lot more insightful and detailed answers to questions like um, why our company, for example, um, and it will really help set you apart from other individuals as well. You should also consider looking at social media, you know, Instagram, also LinkedIn. Um, and a really good tip here is to consider reaching out to people who used to actually work there. This will give you such deeper insight that you wouldn't be able to get from any other research really um, and it's a great way to actually understand the company and its culture if you can actually talk to people who who have experienced that firsthand um, and then very importantly prepare what you're actually going to say so you know bullet point answers to some of those common questions that Gemma um, went through and just really consider how your past experiences might help you really exceed in your role having this fresh in your mind will give you a lot more confidence and you'll have great answers and you won't necessarily rely on notes, um, which you might feel like you can do in a virtual interview, but I would suggest trying not to do that just so that it comes across more, more natural. Um, secondly, you know, be on time, I guess is one of the easiest um, ways to start things off on the right foot. In comparison to those in-person interviews, I don't think you need to be as early, you know, potentially just consider logging on 10 minutes before. Um, and yeah, I mean, definitely enter promptly at the start time to just set things off in the right way. 
Um, thirdly, please do dress for success, even though you might be, you know, in your bedroom or somewhere comfortable at home, you want to dress in the exact same way you would if you were going into the company's offices. Um, and that means I think, you know, the top and the bottom, even though they might not see your, your bottom half, please do consider dressing um, appropriately because you never know what could happen. You might need to jump up to go, um, you know, to the door. You don't want to be caught cool in like inappropriate clothing. That would be really, really bad. Um, and also just dressing in the right way will also get your head in the game and make you feel, again, a lot more confident. And then fourthly, the location and tech. This is something that you would only, you know, consider for these virtual or telephone interviews. Try and find, first of all, a quiet area where you can take the call with, you know, an appropriate, appropriate um, playing background if possible. And make sure you've told any friends or family or anyone in the, in the sort of, environment that you're in um that you're going to be on an interview so that you're not disturbed and so that it, it, it does stay quiet and to really ensure everything does go smoothly try and have a test of the technology beforehand if you can um potentially with a friend or someone you trust so that when you're going in everything is is smooth and then during the interview you just want to treat it like an in-person interview really take it just that seriously i guess with virtual interviews specifically, it can be harder to come across um, that you're engaged compared to when you're in person and you can use body language and prompts like that. So I would suggest things like nodding your head, asking some clarifying questions when necessary will really show the interviewer that you're engaged, you are listening and that you are interested. Um, and also take some notes. This shows you're listening and will also be really helpful when potentially asking questions um, at the end. And I guess off the back of that, do you come to the interviews with questions? I think Gemma mentioned this already, but it does show really good initiative and interest. I would suggest, you know, looking online if you can't think of any, but really try to think of questions that you, you wouldn't have been able to find the answer online. Um, that would be my tip there. And then finally, it is okay to be nervous. I think it really shows that you care. Um, and if you are feeling nervous on those calls, I would suggest just remembering to breathe and also trying to keep, you know, some water nearby that you could reach on to have a sit and take a pause so that you can, you know, reflect before answering those questions. Next slide, please, Lucy. Um, and then in terms of one-to-one -one interviews, quite similar to the virtual interview tips I just gave, again, here, research and preparation really is key. Um, and I think practicing with someone that you trust is essential because you can check things like your pace. Are you talking too fast? Are you talking too slow? Um, and you can make those adjustments if necessary. During these one-to-one -one interviews, you want to be professional. Please don't use any informal language. Um, and I think in terms of just the actual answers themselves, try and be quite concise. I think nothing more than one to two minutes um, is, is needed. Um, and I guess really importantly, just be yourself, relax, try to smile. This will help build rapport. And ultimately, you do want to showcase your personality and ideally join a company where you feel like it suits um, your personality as well. Next slide, please, Lucy. I think this is really important. Um, after the interview, it is worth reaching out to the interviewers to thank them for your time. I don't think many people um, do this, especially like at that younger um, age, and it can make you a lot more memorable. Um, you know, it shows appreciation. They will be grateful. And even though it might seem like you're, you're doing a lot, you're doing too much, I don't think it will come across that way. Um, and I think you should definitely consider doing that. Secondly, you know, reflect after the interview, make some notes on any questions that you remember. Um, and this would be very useful when you're preparing for any future interviews as well. Um, and thirdly, feedback. I can't stress this enough. Regardless of whether you're successful or not, please do reach out and try and get feedback on how, you know, the interview went. Again, this will help you improve for any next um, interview. So it's very, very important. So assessment centres are another sort of style of assessment. And for those who don't know, they're just a way for an employer to get candidates together in a group setting to be assessed. 
Um, it usually is one of the last steps in the process. So it's, it's great if you are here, but it can be quite difficult to crack if you haven't done them before. So in terms of what you can expect, you can expect, you know, interviews. Not every assessment centre will have them, but you should prepare for competency style interviews like Gemma um, went through or potentially motivational, situational interviews. Try and find out what type of interview you'll be having before so you can prepare for that specifically. Um, you may also have some tests. Um, you could be presented with various different types of tests, like psychometric ones, which I will go through on the next slide in a bit more detail. You could also have a presentation. Again, not, not all employers will include this, but if they do, they will be testing you know, your communication and your presentation skills. So it's important here to really ensure that you stick to any time that you've been allocated but also that you follow a very clear structure. And then another thing that could happen are some social and networking events. This could be a lunch, a dinner, a coffee break. But for these, it's very important to just try and socialize, but also prepare good questions and just get to know the people. Do you remember that even though it might feel very relaxed, you are still being assessed. So you just want to be as professional as you can be um, at all times. Thanks, Lucy. So psychometric tests, these are basically assessments that are designed to measure your cognitive ability, your personality, as well as your work behavior. They will indicate to your employer, like your potential basically, and they're usually taken under timed conditions. And there are a range of different psychometric tests, but the ones sort of listed on the slide in front of you are typically the most common ones. So numerical reasoning, as you know, kind of suggests in the name, it's essentially maths, um, and it would test things like your interpretation of charts, graphs, you know, data and statistics. You know, I know maths might not be everyone's favorite thing, but it might not, it wouldn't really go beyond like GCSE level. So it's important to remember here that practice is essential, and the more practice you do, the, the better you'll become, really. Verbal reasoning is tests that will basically assess your understanding of written information. So, for example, you might have to read some text and then answer some questions based on that sort of like comprehension task. Um, and some tests as well might also look at your, your grammar ability and your spelling here will be very essential as well. Um, abstract reasoning, they are basically tests that measure your ability to identify a set of rules and then apply that to a new situation. So you might have like a pattern and you might need to spot what's wrong with that pattern and what will come next in that sequence of, of patterns. Um, so they're just trying to judge how well you can actually follow information and spot those patterns. And then situational judgment. Some of you might have completed this already if you've applied to sort of like retail jobs or anything like that. But basically, you'll be given a sort of hypothetical work-related situation and you'll be asked, you know, what you would do in that situation. For all these tests, the best advice here is to just do as much practice as possible, guys. There are lots of free resources available online and you can kind of see on the, on the screen just um, different websites that you can go to. Um, and I guess when completing them, just be really aware of any time res restrictions and make sure that you read all instructions so that you know what you're doing, essentially. Thanks, Lucy. So on this slide, I just thought it would be useful to show an example of what a typical assessment cent um, centre day could look like and how it could be structured. Um, it's quite easy for it to take up a whole day, as you can see, but it could also be, be half a day. So please do note, guys, that it can vary in terms of the length, in terms of the style and what they actually include in the day. I just thought it would be useful for you to see how it could be set up here. Next slide, please, Lucy. Um, and lastly here, I've just given you guys um, some tips for success. I think we, we have stressed quite a lot. Preparation and practice is essential. Once you find out the format of the day of your assessment centre, please do prepare and practice for any interviews, any tests that you're going to have. When you're actually in the assessment centres, um, it can be easy to dwell on mistakes that you feel like have happened in the previous tasks. But I really would try not to do that, even though it is human and it can happen. 
Try to instead concentrate on performing well in the next task. Um, it's very important to not worry about the other candidates that you're with. Um, it's very easy to try and compare yourself or see them as your competition, but I really wouldn't do that. Instead, focus on just putting your key skills forward. And I guess that follows quite nicely into the next tip, which is that you, in those group discussions, you don't want to see them as your competition. Instead, um, you should consider drawing, especially those more quiet people, into the conversations. This will show great teamwork skills and it can still be done alongside um, making those individual contributions. Um, you know, the next tip is just to stick within all time restrictions. Like I mentioned before, this is essential as you don't want to run out of time when you're completing a task. Um, and then the last two tips, just try and be as friendly and, and as polite with everyone as I'm sure you all are. Um, remember that you're always being assessed and this is you know, essential to making the best impression. And then finally, and, and potentially even most importantly, try and relax and just really let your personality shine and come through. They really do wanna see the real you and get to know what sort of makes you who you are. And that was next bit. Thanks, Valerie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Emily. I'm a principal here at Erevina, slightly older than the rest of the team. Um, this is actually my fourth uh, fourth job job in the sector. Um, my first role was actually recruiting entry level um, people into sales and recruitment jobs. So very much people leaving school, people leaving college, leaving university. So hopefully a few useful tips here as well. Um, Lucy, next. Thank you. Um, so throughout the process, I'm just going to cover a few things around dealing with rejection, around what to do if things go wrong, but also things to remember throughout any interview and application process. Most important thing and the thing that we probably as recruiters and as hiring managers reject people for the most is a kind of lack of engagement. Um, throughout the process, it's the biggest question mark that leaves us as interviewers with so make sure you ask questions if you're not somebody who is naturally inquisitive and you struggle to come up with questions ask the same questions to the in every round of interviewers if you want I've done that before and I've said well I just wanted to see if you're, all of your leadership team are aligned in their views of the business or what they want to take it so there are tips and tricks around that but just make sure you ask them um I've had it before where a candidate was speaking to the CEO of the business and the CEO said, have you got any questions? And they looked at them and said, no. And they go, I'm the CEO of this business and you have no questions for me. It is a massive piece of advice. There are three areas of questions at the moment that will make you stand out as a candidate if you ask. And again, you can ask them in any process, in any business, for any role, because they are three issues facing every single business and every single industry in the world and in the UK at the moment. One is around the current economic status and kind of cost of living crisis. One is around equality, diversity and inclusion. And obviously one is around ESG and sustainability. Um, if you can go with a question and asking what are Aravina doing around having a green agenda or a strategy around sustainability? Um, if you can ask them, I saw on your website, you wanna be 50% female partners by 2025. How many have you got at the moment? That is incredibly impressive. Um, and again, it will make you stand out. Finally, this kind of goes into what Valerie was talking about. Um, always ask questions at the end around the process and around next steps. Um, there's a really, really good question, but it's you've got to have a bit of confidence to ask it, um, which is, do you have any reservations for me? So if you feel you've gotten along well with an interviewer and you've done quite well, or if you maybe think I could have done better answering one of the questions or a couple of the questions, ask them, do you have reservations? Um, quite often they'll say no, um, because it's quite a confronting question anyway. Uh, if they do say yes, actually, I don't think, so I've had it before when I asked it, someone said, I don't think your um, 
kind of confident or uh, you've got kind of as much conviction as you should but actually you asking that question demonstrates that that you do so it is a question that gives you the opportunity just to leave on as positive a note as possible and and, and kind of address any concerns in the room um so yeah most important piece of advice i can give you ask questions um the next slide is just things to remember throughout the process and and kind of i guess um some of this has been covered so i'll probably skip through some of it but feedback like valerie said it is so important um get it because if you don't get the job you'll at least get better um references mentors contacts again i think we've covered it but stay in touch with the people you interview with especially you can reapply in six months and say, oh, do you remember I interviewed with you six months ago? I've actually got six months experience in Tesco's now and I'd love to go for it again. That warm lead, that connection from the past will put you ahead of other people. Um, another really important thing, um, yes, it's being recorded, Femi. Sorry, I've just seen your question. So um, your routine is really important when you're interviewing. Um, you're usually cramming it in around other things, around exams, around school, around work. Um, make sure whatever you do that makes you feel good, that gives you energy, that gives you kind of the, those endorphins, do it. So I don't function unless I've had three coffees at least in the morning. So I know if I'm going for an interview, I've got to make time for having three coffees beforehand. There are other people who will thrive with lots of adrenaline and be really sporty, play football, go for a run, go to the gym before you interview because you'll be in a place where you feel good and you'll you'll kind of perform much better. And then I'm going to go on to kind of what happens if you didn't get the role. Um, I don't think collectively we know a single person and bearing in mind, we probably speak to up to 10 people a day. I don't think collectively any of us at Aravina know anybody that hasn't been rejected from an interview process. Um, Lucy, sorry, is it all right if we just jump to the next slide? Um, everybody is rejected from jobs. I've been rejected from jobs. Every single one of us has been kind of rejected and it's led us to be what I, well, I like to think in the best job now but it will lead to better things. It will lead you to become better and it will certainly give you life experience. It may also give you answers for interviews in future. Someone asks, how do you deal with, how, how, how do you handle rejection? Or give me an example of where you've been resilient. You can turn around and say, well, actually I applied for this job I really wanted a month ago, um, didn't get it. But in return, I sat down, reviewed their feedback, made sure that I had good answers going forwards and, and I executed on what was a, a negative experience and turned it into a positive so you can always take things from interview processes and arguably you'll take more from those that you don't get than from those that you do um the most important thing to do as well is like take it as a win actually getting interviews and taking time to make applications and write a cv is incredibly beneficial and you'll learn a lot and it's also an achievement so like recognize the achievements as well um and i think most importantly take time if you get rejected or you accept a job take time to consider what did you learn through the process do you want the job and do you kind of what do you want to do from it you might get rejected from a job and decide actually that wasn't the job I wanted anyway and it could be a positive so yeah and that is everything from me I'm gonna have to drop off so I'll leave the rest of you with the questions if that's all right thank you Emily I know you've got a one o'clock meeting so thank you very much no um, problem best of luck everyone Let's have a quick look at the um, at the questions. Should we go back up to the top? So I know it's uh, one p.m. Is it okay if we take the questions, or is there a hard ending to this? Um, but... No, please take the questions. Yeah, it'd be great to have your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Really, it's great. I, I know um, we I addressed one of the, the first question, but it, I know we got a question from Lulu. How do I stand out as an interesting candidate when I haven't had direct or paid experience? So Lucy, if you flick back to the My CV section, um, either, either one should be fine. So I think it is hard, it is tough. The, um, how do you get experience if you don't have experience, but you need experience to get experience? It's, I suppose this is where you focus on, I suppose, what are you interested in? Anything in terms of hobbies? Are you a competitive skier? Are you a competitive football player? Are you a competitive 
<laughs> who knows? Um, you could have um, maybe you just play football on the weekends. It's whatever you want, um, whatever you like to do. You can absolutely list your early in your careers, your lives. So you can absolutely say anything like that. Of course, if it's competitive, if it's team building, if it's leadership, the better. And of course, volunteering. Volunteering is your free way in, if you will. Of course, do something that you care about. You are genuinely interested in the cause that you're volunteering in. You'll get some team working skills. You'll get some, um, you, you have some soft skills and learnings from it and you can talk that through. So I suppose that's how you can make yourself that bit more interesting, that bit more, um, I suppose, experienced, even if it isn't direct or paid work experience. And then the next question from Zoe, not sure if it's okay to ask, but do people lie on CVs and do they get caught? So what, this is where we get into, I suppose, a bit of a gray area. Um, there is no such thing as the CV police. No one's going to check your CV or have they done every single word on their CV, but I would not advise it. I would strongly advise against lying on your CV. People probably do do it. Um, but just remember, let's say you get to interview. Let's say you have to face someone and they say, oh, you told me you're a magician. You told me you can do magic tricks. Here's a deck of cards. Do me a magic trick. What do you do then? You've lied and you've been caught. Oh, so I, I placed first in this uh, hard um, ma magic trick competition. Oh, okay, show me a trick then. Now, of course, that's just one example. There's plenty of others. Oh, so you say you're really good at PowerPoint. Can you talk me through what your best tips are, what your best shortcuts are? You've lied, you have nothing to say, and you will be caught. And if you get caught, I don't think it's quite obvious, right? You'll probably get rejected or definitely get rejected. So would not advise it and don't be tempted by other people if they do tell you they are lying on theirs and they get interviews and offers. Even if you do make it to the very end, you get the real job, great. You didn't get caught in your lie. But then you have to do the job and you don't have the skills because you lied. So you will never you never really win, I would say. Uh, so that's my, my advice there. <laughs> and also to jump on there, I think that you know, it's important to remember that are you going to feel good about yourself if you lie on your CV and that's why you get your job? There's a, an element of pride of, you know, being proud of the experience you do have and using that to answer your questions. And, you know, all the experience you do have, I can promise you is good enough for the jobs that you're applying for. As, as Will said, you don't want to get a job that, that you're underqualified for and that you won't be able to do. So, you know, you should be proud when you do get a job for all of the experience that you do have and that you can stack that up. But, you know, I definitely wouldn't definitely wouldn't lie and you won't get the same satisfaction if you get a job that that you you know that you shouldn't have and that someone else maybe deserves more than you yeah i, I think we all have our own, I, we all have our own views on this but it's all pretty aligned yeah don't, don't like <laughs> probably i think that. just just coming in on there though it's really important that you look at the experience that you've got and you look at how you frame that so i'm not saying lie but make what you do sound good because it it is good so for example if you work at starbucks rather than saying oh I work at Starbucks or I work in a cafe, say I work in a busy environment where I serve 85 customers with 100% um, accuracy. Yeah. So really frame what you do. Don't lie about it, but think about how you frame what you do and how you can make it sound like an achievement. But yeah, don't lie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, just going back to my uh, first question as well, just wanted to highlight the volunteering point. So Lucy, if you could cover your mouse on the second page, third bullet point. Yeah, that one. Uh, down, down, down slightly. Uh, yeah, so if as you can see there, that point, that's fund uh, fundraising. So I fundraise £400 for a charity. And then below that, a night shelter. So I volunteered. That's on my CV. It, that's what you can write to stand out, fill out your CV a bit. So if you don't have the paid experience, which is totally fine, volunteered under 10 hours, supported X, Y, Z. So that's, uh, I suppose, how a real example, I did apply, this is very real. I did volunteer at a night shelter, I didn't lie, I didn't exaggerate anything. So that's a hard example of, I suppose, telling the truth and volunteering, making yourself stand out when you don't have the other sections. And then I know we're getting lots of questions, other questions now. So on the ESG point, so Lucy responded to that environmental, social and governance. So for example, what's, uh, what's the ESG impact of your company's work? 
if you work in oil and gas, the environmental Im impact isn't very good. So I suppose that's how I think about it. You can do it very quickly. Social, uh, so if you sell weapons or tobacco, is that a good social impact? That's the kind of thing in terms of ESG. We have a lot of more questions coming in. Oh, Lucy, um, got, got, got a question from Lulu. Do you have any work experience at Aravina? How do I get into recruitment? I suppose we can all have our own take on this, but... Um... We, we, do, we do do work experience, yes. And it's always worth, we don't have um, a formal um, channel, but it's always worth approaching us and asking us because we often have projects. So for example, I've had interns uh, working with me, Valerie actually came through um, through an yeah. intern scheme. Um, but yes, it's always worth, worth reaching out, uh, reaching out to us and letting us know if you, if it's something that you're interested in. And often we will find a project. Um, so in marketing, I have over a couple of summers, I've had um, school leavers or people in the middle of their university degrees coming and working with me for a number of weeks or months. Um, and I've found projects. Um, and the other thing I'll say is we always pay our interns because I think I hate um, organisations who take interns, expect them to do a proper job and then don't pay them. So, yes, please do reach out to us if you're ever interested in coming, um, coming and giving it a go. I would also say kind of in terms of getting into recruitment, obviously I started as a grad and the um, the channel I used was the Graduate Recruitment Bureau, which you could give a Google and they'll have lots of jobs there and you can kind of, they'll give you a call if you apply to it and they'll be able to talk you through kind of roles in recruitment and they take you through the process and that's how I got my job in Aravina and I do really recommend it. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, just a, a, a more than half an hour jam packed of top tips. So hopefully, um, you know, even if people didn't quite catch anything um, or everything on today's uh, session, they'll be able to go back and pick out things from the recordings and from the snapshots that we do from this. So thank you so much indeed. And as Lucy said, if there are any additional questions, please send them to us and we're more than happy to send them on to the experts. So once again, thank you very much, Aravina. Um, thank you for your time and for your expert advice. And thanks everyone for joining.